All righty, it's 4.02. Let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to our first time listeners. Welcome back to those who joined us Tuesday for session number one, the undersea cloud. Don't look up, look down. My name is Heather Warren and I'll be your moderator for this webinar series brought to you by the Suboptic Foundation in Siena. Today's topic, building across the digital divide, will be presented by two submarine experts from META. The session will walk you through planning process that occurs when building and operating a submarine cable. And then part two will feature an overview of the new submarine cable network to Africa that is currently being constructed. When constructed, that cable will circumvent the continent of Africa, connect many African coastal countries to Europe and the Middle East. Each of our sessions are recorded and posted. As an attendee, you will have joined and noticed that you don't have speaker access or video access. However, we wanted this to be interactive, so we strongly suggest using the Q&A down at the bottom left-hand side of your screen for any questions you have throughout the presentation, the chat function for any comments you have to our speakers, and then a reactions icon. Give us a thumbs up or our presenters a hand um, on the bottom right-hand side so that we know you like what you see. I'll now pass the floor over to our first pre presenter, Tim Stutch for Meta. Take it away, Tim. Thanks, Heather. Let me uh, turn on my screen sharing and verify that you can see that. We can. Looks good, Tim. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about the what it takes to build a submarine cable uh, and cover off a, a number of different topics uh, about the, the, the people that are involved, the, the companies, how you interact, and then a little bit about the technology that's required to make it happen and sort of uh, pick apart the pieces that are part of a submarine cable. So my name is Tim Stutch. I've been working in, in the uh, submarine space for about 15 years, but been doing IP and transport networking for 25 years. Uh, for a number of different companies. I've built networks and designed them uh, and deployed them on every continent except Antarctica at this point. Um, and I've encountered a lot of things. Uh, there's always something new to, to be found that, the, you know, what causes an issue or what's an interesting problem. One of the things I really like about the subsea space is it's so multidisciplinary that I get to work with a broad range of folks. It's a lot of people that are very different than me different opinions. We have to solve different problems together. And it's really, um, really helps me to get energized during the day uh, because it's, it's uh, such a different thing almost all the time. I think uh, Cynthia will cover off on a lot of the <laughs> particularities of that, but I'll try to give you some sense of that uh, as we move forward. So I think if you participated in the first session, a number of these topics were covered, but I wanna set a little bit of a baseline for understanding. Um, you know, the internet is built on, on fiber optics, not on satellites. And particularly, your country is connected to all the other countries via submarine cables. So they are very, very important. There are a large number of them. If you go to the submarinecablemap.com website that tell geography sponsors, you can find details of each of the currently active cables, where they connect, who the owners are. Uh, it's a very interesting place to go look um, to see what's connecting various parts of the world. But you can see here, just as a quick overview, uh, a lot of things follow what we would call traditional shipping routes for how they connect between countries. That's usually the shortest path. Um, but the takeaway is, is that over 98% of the data that gets transmitted between countries is carried on submarine cables and not on satellites. So with that in mind, Let's talk about what you have to do to build a new subsea cable. Um, I mentioned this before, but they're expensive, right? They're, they're, they're complex, maybe, and, and, and difficult at times as well. Um, and then they're certainly multidisciplinary. So there's all sorts of engineering skills that are required to build a submarine cable. There's mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. You have to do the optical engineering to understand the system design so you can actually push bits from one side of one side of the ocean to the other. There's civil engineering, there's a lot of construction that goes on. Um, almost all the work is done on the water or under the water. So there's a tremendous amount of things that go on in terms of marine operations. So this involves very large vessels down to divers at the beach, those sorts of things. You have to have people that are planning your network to understand where do you want to connect. 
you have to have money, so you have finance. By most countries consider submarine cables what is called critical infrastructure. And as a result, they want to have some say in how you do things. So that's this permitting piece that's there. And then no, lastly, you know, you kind of have to work together to do this. And so you have to have people that can, can, can work through the, the legal and commercial pieces of the contract. How much does it cost? Who's going to pay for what? Those kinds of things. At its base, the submarine cable is a very constrained resource. Once you put it in the water, you can't expand it. You can't add to it. It is what it is. Um, the, the number of fiber pairs is limited. And so as a result, it demands cutting edge technology to get the most out of that resources you can. So that means all, all aspects of it are sort of pushed the envelope, both from a components inside of the pieces of the submarine cable to what the system design is, to even how you do things for cable protection. This is like, how do you bury it so that it, it, fishing fleet doesn't destroy it or something like that. Um, this constant evaluation or constant evolution is forcing from an engineering perspective to look at all the pieces on a regular basis. So this is a lot of fun for me because I get to stay in front of what's going on in both the electrical and the mechanical and the optical pieces uh, on a regular basis. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is, is that the submarine cables are all multinational, right? So that consequently, when you have multiple countries involved, different things can impact it, right? So if you have a geopolitical issue or maybe a relationship between countries that changes or an election that occurs, you may have to change your plans, right? Um, because of the way cables are built, you have to deal with sort of from the beach to the bottom of the ocean. And that means you have to talk to perhaps someone that owns the cabana club at the beach to land the thing uh, all the way to dealing with the UN. So the breadth of interaction there is quite large. And then typically you have a large number of partners that requires you to, uh, they have different goals perhaps than you do, you get to negotiate. And then the last big picture takeaway is, is that, you know, it might only take 24 months. That's a really short time, but it, more like 60 months, but to build a cable, but you're probably going to operate it for at least 15 years, if not 25. So the commitment from the organization needs to be a very long-term one. So how do you get started? Well, all right. For a new cable, you need to have a group of folks that recognize or have some desire to make a connection between company countries. They either they, they have a business model that they sell capacity or that they are developing it to support other parts of their business. They have to have enough money to invest. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then we'll, and they have to be able to discuss between themselves, how are they going to do the various pieces? So uh, we have to do a design. We have to worry about how, which countries are we connecting? Where is it routing on the seafloor? Who is paying for what? And those sorts of things. So I'll talk a little bit here about the individual pieces of that. Um, you know, one or two, three handfuls of companies in the world will, will build a cable by themselves, or maybe a private investment company and venture capital might do it. But in general, there are multiple partners because you connect multiple countries. And that's part and parcel. If you want to expand or make a more complicated cable, you start adding more and more partners, right? So the more countries, the more regulatory pieces, uh, that you add, the more that it becomes complicated, right? So if you add partners, great, you can reduce your cost. You know, I pay less, I pay 10% instead of 20%, but now we have, you know, 10 partners instead of five. And then you also have to discuss how much capacity do you want to put into the water, right? Um, it's very easy to say, well, we can negotiate and try to put in you know, a high number of fiber pairs so that we can reduce the cost on a, what we call a cost per bit basis. But that doesn't shrink the total cost. It just shrinks, shrinks the cost per individual fiber pair. Um, this is this uh, balance of cost versus unit capacity and risk. So um, the last one is we have to go through a, 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 typically a very competitive bidding process. 
so that we can sort of get the best of breed that technology that we were talking about before, but also the right price, uh, the right schedule. There, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And there's a limited number of ships. Uh, there's limited factory capacity. So some people may be busy and not be able to do it at the time frame that you want. Um, and then there's always technological differences between companies as they do for product refresh. So at the moment in time that you're talking about building a cable, you may make a decision that you would have differently than you would have made two years previous or two years after based upon all of those kinds of things. Okay. So I want to give you a sense of what a, a, a new cable build looks like from a project planning standpoint. Uh, we talked about sort of this inception approval, for this first bucket on the left, uh, it goes through a, you have to have a capacity forecast, some desire to build the, the cable, you have to identify who you're working with. Then there's a whole lot of engineering and negotiation between both the parties that are building the cable and the party that perhaps will, sorry, the, what we would typically call purchasers. So it's the group that wants to build the cable, they're working together. And then the, um, that's this engineering system design. You, RFP is request for proposal. Typically in the submarine space, it's called an invitation to tender or ITT. So there's a whole lot of things that go on, but once you've made the vendor selection, you've decided to move forward with the contract, a key term in submarine is contract enforcer, you have SIP, right? And what that means is, is there's now a commercially and legally binding contract between the purchasers and one system vendor, one or more. And there, the schedule then starts to clock for building things, working together to pick, uh, do the permitting. You have to do underwater surveys for the routes. You actually have to build the whole submarine cable. So 40, 50,000 kilometers of, of submarine cable with multiple fiber pairs inside the, Cynthia will touch on this again later. And then you actually have to put it all on a boat and go put it in the water. And once you've built the whole thing, then there's a whole part of about network acceptance that involves testing to make sure that it meets the technical requirements and the, uh, that there's all of the contracts are in place to maintain it. And then you get to a point where it's called ready for service or ready for, for preliminary acceptance. And then it becomes a network that's in operation. That first four set there might last 24 to 60 months. Um, but then you're, again, like I say, you'll be operating it probably for 15, maybe to 25 years, depending upon the commercial life of the network. At a very high level, that was a quick overview of the pieces that are involved to get you from the idea of building a cable. Who do you have to work with? How do you get to this point? And now I want to talk a little bit about what are the pieces so that we can talk about the technology that's involved and you can get a look at some of the things that actually go into the water. So what I have here is a diagram of a typical submarine cable. Um, it would be bookended on the, on the right-hand side of the screen with the same set of stuff on the other side. So you go from one shore location through the water to another one. And we'll start with what's called typically the dry plant. And this includes something called SLTE, which is submarine line terminating equipment. This is the thing that is the photonic or DWDM device that actually uses lasers to light up connectivity from one location to another. Power feed equipment we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, the, the cable has to be powered. There's a bunch of things on land, the cable landing station, um, and then the little bit there called the beach manhole, which is actually where the land cable meets what's called the submarine cable. And there's a joint at the beach where you connect your power and your fiber optics, and it actually goes into the water uh, and out to sea. Now, the cable itself has various constructions. Um, I actually have one here I can show you, give you some sense of how big it is. So maybe about the size of a nickel. Um, hopefully that showed up a bit with no armor on it, but we'll talk about the different armoring types. That's the cable that encompasses a couple of things uh, itself. These little devices in the bottom here are called repeaters. You can only push an optical signal so far through a fiber optic before the signal degrades enough that you actually have to do an amplification. 
And then there's also, so there's a number of repeaters on the ocean floor. And then there's another device called a branching unit, which lets you sort of split the traffic into different directions or split that power feed equipment that's powering the network into different directions. So you load all these things on a ship, put them on the ocean floor um, in a very controlled process that involves a lot of uh, uh, ROV or remote operated vehicles and other devices that are used to put things on the seafloor. Um, those are the basic kind of components for a submarine cable. And we're gonna talk through each of these pieces here quick. So the first one is what is an SLTE and what does it do? And I sort of mentioned this, but this will give you some idea of what that is, which is it takes the data that you wanna move from one location, converts it into an optical signal and, and puts it into the submarine cable fiber optic to the other shore, All right? So very simple, that's just basically what the SLTE does. Now, how does it do that? So we're gonna talk very briefly about wave division multiplexing. And the idea of wave division multiplexing is to use a laser and something called a modulator, which is basically something that allows you to signal with the laser at a very high rate of speed and if you choose your lasers to be slightly different colors, if you will, you can create a whole rainbow of pieces. And I can use some technology to combine a large number of these colors of light together into a single beam to go into a one fiber optic cable, a one fiber optic strand. And I do the same thing at the far end and I use the same technology and I split that wide range of colors back out and give each receiver the appropriate color. So the red laser on the left goes to the red receiver on the right, all the way down through the stack. This is what's called wave division multiplexing. And if you were to look at that line after it was combined, you'd see all of those individual signals for all the different channels that were there. So this is how I take all oh, say 60 channels and combine them together to put one signal on the line, right? So this is, there's your definition. And to give you some example, this is a little bit dated, but that is what allows you to use multiple terabits of transport capacity on a single fiber. You might take a single 100 gigabit line, or 100 gigabit signal, but if I take 120 of them, that gives me 12 terabits per second of capacity on a fiber optic cable. And this is the backbone of, of the communications industry for enabling a tremendous amount of content to be used on a, on a fiber optic. All right, I mentioned this before, I wanna give a little bit of discussion about the different types of cable, but it also points out here, and let me see if I can do my laser pointer. Um, this is the piece that I showed you before, the lightweight cable. And what this is, is the baseline piece. And in the center are fiber optics, fiber optic strands that are encased inside of a small vault that then have uh, some gel put in there. They are surrounded by this set of steel wires. That is what's called the strength member. This is the thing that provides the continuity to, remember, you got to put this on the ocean floor. So you have to be able to lower it and pick it up. Uh, and then it might go to 8,000 meters. So you that's 24,000 feet down. 24,000 feet of cable weighs an awful lot. So you have to be able to have some strength for it. And then this copper piece is the conductor for that powering. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But every single type of cable has both the strength piece in the middle and the copper piece here. And then it's wrapped in what's called polyethylene. It's this white portion there. So we'll figure out how to turn it off. There. Okay, so there are other kinds of cable beyond just the lightweight. There's the special app, the SPA special application. If you saw the other day, there was a question about sharp bites. Uh, the, poly, the little mylar shield that you see there is, prevents those things. You also worry about having what's called armoring because um, the, the a large percentage of the things that cause faults in cable networks is based upon 
uh, fishing and other human activities like a ship will drag an anchor. So you want to provide an external piece that provides armoring for it. So those are the cable pieces. So you go all the way from just the lightweight all the way up to what's called double armor, where it has a lot of extra strands of protective coating around it. We talked about the repeaters. The repeater is a device that provides the regeneration of the optical signal on the sea floor, right? Uh, it does both directions, so there's only one of these is bidirectional, both what it says east and west, but the idea being uh, the, the light that's coming from the left through it goes to the right, and the right goes through to the left, and both get amplified at the same time. Because it sits on the sea floor and picking the thing up and recovering it and, and fixing it makes it is a very difficult thing, uh, you, you really want to make it highly reliable. So reliability is a particularly important aspect of that. To give you some sense of how big this is, I have some dimensions here, but a typical repeater will weigh out the order of 500 pounds, 225 kilograms. It's about, um, <laughs> excuse me, five meters long. You can see the piece in the middle, it's called the pressure vessel. It's designed to go down to 8,000 meters of sea depth so that it's tremendously pressure resistant. And then it has some things on the outside. These are called the bend limiters. Uh, this is what when it's deployed so that the cable doesn't bend and kink and break any of the internal fiber optics that we were talking about. So that gives you some sense of how big the repeater is. There's another device I mentioned before called a branching unit. And what a branching unit is, and this is a picture, it looks a lot like a lot of companies will use very similar, what we call bodies for the repeaters and the branching units. So this one in particular is a subcom, but uh, there's a number of other vendors. They all look very similar. It's the same idea. The branching unit takes, basically allows you to connect in three different directions. Uh, there's a picture of it going into the water there. And what the branching unit does is a number of things. Um, it allows you to split the traffic from what's called the trunk onto a branch. So if you were building a network that had three locations, you have to be able to take the fiber optics that are in the center of that cable that was built. Let's say you had 12 fiber pairs and you get to some location and you want to send six of them in one direction and six of the fiber pairs in the other direction, you would use a branching unit to do that. So you can route the optical connectivity with a branching unit. The other thing that it does is allows for what's called power path switching or power switching. We'll talk a little bit later about what the PFE does, but fundamentally you have to power the system from the shore and the branching unit allows you to reconfigure which one of these, let's say CLS, it's cable landing station, which one of the cable landing stations is powering which portion of these three different legs here. One of the other things that a branching unit does is allows for what's called add drop multiplexing or optical add drop multiplexing. And there's a device that is attached to the BU. It's another body that looks very similar to a repeater that has inside of it some devices with something called a wavelength selective switch, or you might have which is a straight fiber switch, or you might have in the past had a selectable set of filters to allow you to take a portion of the optical spectrum and send it in one direction versus the other. What this diagram is showing you here is a WSS based solution where the traffic from the station on the left enters the branching unit. Some of it goes to the branch and the yellow light continues on to the other far end SLTE. And that branch is able to connect to that far, the, the right hand side cable landing station as well with its own traffic. This allows for a great deal of flexibility for how much traffic do I send in individual locations. Um, it might be important to split it in half. Sometimes you only want to send a small amount of traffic to some location because it's it's maybe a single island or uh, you want to divide the traffic in a pretty granular way. So the other thing that the BU will let you do is, is send the, tra the optical traffic into different directions in a very granular manner most often now. Okay, so I mentioned the PFE. 
And this is just a representation because the repeaters are on the seafloor. All the devices in the network are powered from shore. You need the battery, there's no batteries that will last that long or, or any of the rest of it. So there's no alternative except to connect a conductor from one side to the other and use high power and high voltage application of DC power to power all of them. So if you can think about it, mm, you know, for me, it would be like I have Christmas tree lights, but I extend them like a thousand miles, <laughs> but I can only put one plug in, right? So the the repeaters are all powered from shore. You build it and it like it has the number there, 18 kilovolts for, for like a trans-Pacific application. Um, and the repeaters are space. We didn't talk about system design, uh, but somewhere between like 70 and 100 kilometers apart, depending upon how you want to do it. So that conductor takes the electricity from one side, pushes it out to all of the repeaters, and that's what's powering that optical regeneration. Uh, and so the PFE is a very important piece of equipment, but it does some funny things to, they're, they're not, you know, if you get a cable cut, we didn't talk about repairs or anything yet, but you can have issues with uh, powering the entire cable if you have a fault somewhere along the way that doesn't allow the power to propagate. And that's where that BU power switching comes into play. Okay, so that was a very quick introduction to the pieces of a submarine cable. So the, the repeater is probably, and the branching unit are the devices that are the underwater bodies. Um, the cable itself has various constructions depending upon where you put it. I think with this now, when you saw the different armoring types, if you look more closely at this picture now, that the double armored cable would be in the shallow water near shore. You might change down to a single armored cable as you go further out to the continental shelf. And once you get out to below 1,000 or 1,500 meters, you're only using that lightweight cable with just the polyethylene. So out in the middle of the ocean, it, it, you know, at 5,000 meters depth, the thing that's sitting on the sea floor, that's the submarine cable, is only about the size of a quarter in diameter. And then again, you have the pieces on shore, the power feed equipment, which is powering all the devices that are in the water, the SLTE that's lighting up the fiber optic that's in the center of all the cable that's actually moving the data from one end to the other. Okay, so we talked about the people that are involved, you have to be able to negotiate and all the sort of basic building blocks. Okay, now you wanna build a cable. So now you wanna design it. This is a very dense slide. I'll take a minute to talk through some of it here, but there's all kinds of considerations that go on, right? Again, it's where are you gonna land? This is a picture of South Korea, Japan um, and Taiwan. So it's a pretty congested space. There's a number of cables that are there. There are different economic exclusion zones. There are other places that are fisheries related that are precluded. You have to worry about who can test what space, where do you wanna bury, how deep do you need to bury it? Are there any other participants on the seafloor like power and gas that are doing something in the location? Um, and so you build up this route, you decide you wanna connect several points, you need to worry about crossing anything like a, a power cable from a wind farm or a gas pipeline. And then you have to go get the permits to do those things. And then I need to do, down at the bottom of the list there is one called unexploded ordinance. This was something that was very interesting to me by five, six years ago when we were building Morea. Um, a portion of the cable crossed what was a World War II um, artillery range or gunnery range in the ocean. And we had to do an unexploded ordinance or UXO survey to make sure we weren't gonna put the cable on top of unexploded bombs in the water. So once you get to where you wanna do and you have all the pieces and parts and you've done the design, there's all kinds of other things that come into play about building a submarine cable. There's a whole lot of these things on day four. Uh, Steve Arsenal, uh, Lorraine Gray and Mike Clare are gonna talk about all the different parts that are sort of on this list. But I wanted to give you a high level sense of what the parts were that you were needed to worry about after you've got all the, all the pieces, your Legos, if you will, to build the cable, but now you actually have to connect it to land 
And as soon as you say that, you're starting involving people and governments and other existing things. So very complex, a lot of interactive parts, but it's part of what makes the, the thing that interesting to, to work on. Okay, so you've worked through all of that. How do you actually build the thing? Um, it's a pretty straightforward process, except that it has, again, lots of pieces on the, this is sort of a diagram that shows you the cable construction from cable landing station, CLS to that beach manhole, the BMH you talked about. So you have to do things on land. So that involves something that's very similar to most terrestrial implementations. You do the land cable. You can see here the picture of the, the folks uh, putting the cable into the ductwork underground to some location. And then once you get to the sea or the beach, if you will, the beach manhole, there are different ways to connect to the water. One is called a pre-laid shore end where they might build out from the beach manhole to some location, uh, deploy the cable, they'll put it on a buoy and leave it in the water because it's not ready to connect for that piece in the middle of the main lake. So there's a number of things there. Uh, again, they'll talk about it on session four about you know route clearance, laying the cable here. That yellow device you see in the water is something called a plow that allows you to bury the cable under the seafloor by basically feeding the cable through it into a shear that buries it you know one or two meters deep. Um, once you get out to some certain water depth, a couple hundred meters, uh, you'll then go to part of what's called the main lay. And we'll talk a little bit about the boat or the ship here in, in a moment. But again, you have to go through, put the, the cable onto the ship and then unload it in a, a controlled fashion on a pre-designed route. So there's lots of things on the ship that are very important for keeping track of where it's at and making sure it can maintain its location. And then the other end, there's something called the direct landing, which is where it just comes right off the boat. They float it in on a set of balloons, basically. Uh, I have a picture of that later. Uh, and, and then once you get to that other end side and in the cable landing station, you, again, you have your terminal equipment for, for installation. So this is the SLTE and the PFE. But if you think about it here, to get to the right hand side, I got to build the cable landing station. So someone has to do some civil construction, right? They have to do the beach manhole, which is you go out to the beach and you dig a big hole in the ground and you basically put a concrete vault there. But it also has to have that connectivity via the ductwork on land to put the cable into. And it also has to point out to sea so that you can make the connectivity to that submarine cable that's on that boat so that you can connect from one end to the other. A lot of different things involved in here because Again, two different countries, two different sets of regulations, two different languages. Right? I have a picture of a, of a main lay vessel to give you some sense of how big these ships are. So four or 500 feet long, right? Uh, 10 megawatt power plant. So this is like a medium sized cruise ship <laughs> sized vessel, but a lot more power. But the the one of the things that's important is, is like the, if you look down at the bottom, again, you can see they actually have engine nacelles rather than it's not just it's not like propeller at the back of the boat. They have these engine pods, and they also have bow and stern thrusters, so they can control the ship very accurately in terms of its position. There are a set of cable tanks in the middle, so those bluish colored. Pieces are where you will spool the cable into the ship. Uh, you have to load it at shore um, and, and you offload it out the back of the boat. You can see the yellow plow hanging at the back of the ship. Uh, those are about 15 feet tall, maybe 20, something like that. Um, and then at the upper or sort of front of the ship, you can see another yellow device. This is a remote operated vehicle or ROV. And those are used for a number of different things, uh, again, that we'll talk about later in more detail. But you'll do things like you'll take that ROV, it has cameras on it. If you've, in, if you've plowed the cable in, you'll go back with the ROV and do a visual inspection, right? Or you might do some jetting with some water jets on the ROV so that uh, you can bury the cable 
and then go back and inspect that it's there. And then the other piece of this is, is that these boats are at sea for quite a long time. So this, this one describes like a 60 day endurance, you know, a transit across the Atlantic Ocean is, is a couple of days, the Pacific is longer. Um, you might have to pick up your cable at a location in, let's say, the east coast of the United States. And if you're deploying it in, or, or let's say, northern Europe, but you might have to travel all the way around Africa to do that for a long period of time. When you're laying the cable, you don't, you're not cruising at a very high speed. So you need to be able to stay out for a long period of time. Um, the other comment is, is that they typically do like a 12 on 12 off shift. And so there's a large number of people, but it's very much, a, it's a, a lot of work getting done uh, in a very short period of time. And then I have one more picture here. Uh, that is the, the direct landing. So I mentioned this before. Um, there's a link here. If you go to the link on the very bottom, uh, TPC-1 was a cable that was built in 1964. And there is a historical film that's kept at a, at a Japanese um, archive, I guess. For but and it's all in Japanese, but it gives you a really kind of interesting look at what the telecommunications industry looked like in 1964. It still has switchboard operators manually connecting different locations, teletype machines, and all the rest. Um, I find this set of pictures interesting because SJC two is landing in the same location as TPC one. 50 years later, essentially, right? And you can see there's still a lot of room for innovation in some places here. They're direct landing it the same way. It looks very similar, even though it's 50 years later. And, and SJC was a much higher capacity cable than TPC-1, but they still went to the beach in the same fashion. So um, with that, I've gone through the slides that I have. I have some other backups if people have additional questions. We can look a little bit further at some of those other aspects. But for now, um, I guess, uh, Heather, I don't know if you've gotten any questions. I have, Tim. Thank you. Excellent presentation. One of the first questions we had come in is, what is the longest cable system that can be built? Oh, well, um, you could go around the world, I think, <laughs> if you wanted to. Uh, Cynthia will have some interesting numbers in two Africa. It's, it depends on how you count it. So um, one of the key constraints is that power feed equipment. So the, the, the fiber or the cable loses power because the conductor, you know, resistivity, you know, Ohm's law. Um, so you're limited to how far you can go in a single hop, if you will by how much power you can put into the cable to, to power off. But um, if you land at different locations or you use one of those branching units, you could split the powering. So as an example, we go, oh, I forget which cable it is, but let's say 16, 17,000 kilometers across the Pacific, but there's a branching unit in the Philippines or in Guam where the power is pointing in both directions, but the trunk continues on. So if you were to do things like that, you could literally get all the way around the world. There's no, no limitation. It's the power that's the problem, not any yeah. of the rest of it. All right, thank you for that. Wow. What's the difference between a cable landing station and a data center? You were showing that slide with the SLTE on both sides. You mm -hmm. showed a POP and a cable center. Can you tell us the difference between that cable landing station and a data center? Sure. Um, a, a cable landing station, there's a bunch of, the, the nomenclature sometimes is, 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 can be confusing and, and sometimes overlaps. So POP actually stands for point of presence, right? And a data center is a location that typically has uh, traditionally computers in it that do compute and, and other things. The cable landing station typically is a place that the cable terminates from the ocean into a building on land that has the power feed equipment to power the cable. Having said that, you could have a facility that was a cable landing station that powered the cable, had the equipment for the cable, and in the building right next door or even in the same building, you have a bunch of computers and, and servers and whatnot that would be the POP. So they could actually be the same thing. Typically, they get discussed because they serve different roles. Uh, and in a lot of cases, the cable landing station will be a standalone 
thing because perhaps it's in a location that isn't useful. I'll give one other example. There is a cable that lands in the whales uh, that the cable landing station is actually a small building behind an amusement park at the seashore, but it goes to the data center. The cable actually continues on from there terrestrially all the way into London. Um, so hopefully that answers the question about the distinction. It did. Thank you, Tim. How does Facebook connect to inland countries or remote countries that are not on cables that you own? Cables that we own. Um, so there are a lot of potential, uh, there's a whole ecosystem of people that will sell you connectivity um, from, it's usually called a lease circuit, or they might give you a, a portion of the network. But let's, you have to get to, let's just say I wanted to go to the center of country B from on a different continent from country A. I might acquire a lease circuit and typically what would happen is one of those vendors would show up and you know we can talk about it. Like Colt is one in Europe, let's say. Uh, they would sell me connectivity from one location to the other. Um, so there's a ways around, there's a lot of, back to that beginning of my presentation, there's a lot of companies that build submarine cables so that they can sell you services on it to connect your network together. Um, if you didn't have a large demand, then it'd be a way that you went about doing it. So we would connect with a leased circuit via some of the local providers, and you might string together a bunch of them, right? If, if somebody couldn't get you all the way there, you might get to a location that's called the um, internet exchange, a different kind of pop, and then connect, you know, using company A to get you to the internet exchange, and then the company B to get from the internet exchange to that last bit to the middle of the country. That's a okay. pretty standard way that everyone does that. All right. How does a cable break testing occur with the COTDR? Is there a COTDR deployed at each CLS? And is the test reach configured to go past a BU? So the first part, how does a cable break testing occur with a COTDR? So a COTDR is a coherent optical time domain reflectometer. And what it does is it adds a, a signal to a fiber optic. We didn't talk about it, but inside of each one of the repeaters is a small grating that reflects the light back towards the direction it came from on the other fiber pair or other piece of the fiber pair. And so basically you can think about a COTDR as shining a light in on one end and at every repeater, a piece of it comes back. So if you if you do pulses, you send a pulse in, and then you time how long it for, takes for the signals to get back, you can know how far it went before it got reflected. What will happen is eventually you'll stop getting reflections. So if the cable is broken, you'll get a reflection from the first repeater, from the second repeater, from the third repeater. If the break is between the third and fourth repeater, then you won't get any more follow on. Okay. Right, so the, the light essentially you'll shoot a pulse in and then you wait for it to come back from all of those sort of little partial mirrors along the way. And then eventually it, it, that will help you determine roughly where the break is. Uh, another way, just as an aside, you can also use the power feed equipment to figure out where there's a break because the if you cut the cable, where the cable is cut underwater becomes a ground electrically. And it will change the amount of voltage that your PFE is sees being implied input into the cable. So you can actually make a determination from the power feed equipment. Again, roughly how far does the where is the break inside of the cable? Uh, and that, that pretty much leads to the next question, which I think you answered, which is, are you doing these fixes remotely in the knock? Where are these repairs on these cables being uh, performed? Well, the repair, I mean, th there's two pieces, right? One is is figuring out where did it happen. Very important and very critical. Uh, as So that can be done remotely in a lot of cases. If you go back in time to say 15 years ago, typically a cable landing station would have a COTDR on a cart that got wheeled around and you, someone at the cable landing station would have to hook it up and make the test. Oh, wow more modern equipment actually has it embedded in with the equipment that that dry plant piece that we talked about before 
so you can do it remotely. So the remote detection of the break happens. But there's another piece to this. Um, usually, if you have a break, uh, if it's anywhere close to the shore or you suspect it's nearby, you definitely want to take the time to investigate in a more, what I would call, traditional old school, walk the route, drive from the cable landing station down to the beach, use something called that you can do something with PT called electroding, where you basically use a probe to, to measure the power uh, that's buried in the wall uh, underneath the soil, because it's, it's happened before, people have made a determination that there was a break and it was in, you know, two kilometers offshore, when in fact it was on land oh, in wow. the beach mantle. Fix it there. Right. And, but what happened was they called up the repair ship, which cost, you know, a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> plus a day. It, so come out, right. there, it cost you a million dollars. Guess what? You could have paid someone 10,000 bucks to fix a thing in a beach mantle instead of spending a million dollars to have the boat come out and do it. So determining where it's at, if it's anywhere close to shore, you definitely want to use the sort of old Mark one eyeball and find out for sure where it's at before you start involving a significant amount of resources to fix something that, that's not necessary. So remote determination is very important. Uh, it allows you to kind of figure out, yeah, it's busted way out in the ocean and we got we to gotta get a fix. But if it's anywhere close, you definitely need to have people there. Manpower. Okay. Tuesday, the speaker mentioned a 25-year life, and you also mentioned that in uh, one of your slides. What's the hardest part of making a system reliably operate for this long, and how do we make sure it can perform that long? How do we how do we meet those 25 years? So there's a lot of um, I mentioned early on, sort of the electrical and mechanical engineering pieces. If if people make changes that that push the technology envelope that I talked about. Um, they have this whole process that's called certification. So one of the things that anybody that makes the components for a submarine network signs up for, if you will, in the contract in a legally binding way is, is that the device will operate for that length of time, uh, 25 years. So what that means is, is that you choose, uh, in a lot of cases, a very robust and resilient implementation of the electronics um, versus something that's maybe fancier and more adjustable. Uh, in some ways, the, the things inside of the, the, the bodies underwater are uh, built more to be robust and simple rather than complicated and, and, and super flexible. Um, the Biggest thing is also tied to sort of the manufacturing of the, the subcomponents. So you're talking about, can you make sure that the printed circuit boards that you put all these parts onto and put them inside of one of those repeater bodies last that long? And there's an awful lot of manufacturing tests that goes into that. Uh, the same thing occurs for, for the, the fiber optic cabling. Um, one of the things that's occurring in the industry now is there's a bit of a transition from copper conductor to aluminum conductor cables because aluminum is less expensive than copper, actually weighs less in the water, uh, and has some other advantages in terms of stability of the marketplace, if you will. But there are some concerns about this 25-year lifespan. Um, and I want to make one other note. Uh, if you go to see Priyant's talk on, on, on the next section, on session three, I think that's on the 4th of October, he's gonna talk a lot about optical transmission um, and some other things. He should probably mention something called Shannon's Limit, which is sort of a theoretical possibility that, or not possibility, the theoretical explanation of how much capacity you could put in a single fiber pair. And we're getting close to Shannon's Limit in terms of how much capacity can we put onto a single fiber pair. So in my career, the, the amount of capacity that was available from one generation to the next of the SLTE or the wet plant improvements has just jumped repeatedly over and over and over again. So there, that 25 year lifetime is sort of the engineering time. That 15 year commercial number um, is, is uh, more about how fast things were changing. 
So if you go look at a cable that was deployed in 2010 in the Atlantic, let's say, the amount of capacity that you could put on that cable versus something that's being deployed now is probably a tenth of the capacity. So the commercial viability then changes as well. So that 25 year lifetime is something that gets talked about in the industry. I'm being a little long winded here, but I wanted to make sure there's lots of different directions on this piece of, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing it from an engineering perspective, but you also have to understand from the big picture, is it even worth pursuing or not? It's the standard, um, but I think a lot of cables will come out of the water or be turned off before that 25 year number. So we had a question come in yesterday, Tim, that I think is up your alley in regards to splicing. So the question was, you know, in subsea, in subsea fiber pairs from four to 16 and above now enabled by SDM technology, would you say there is a notable increase during repairs slash splicing for these increased numbers of fiber pairs? Yeah, I wanna show, I have another slide I wanna to get to. Great. Um, this is what's called jointing, but it's, it's splicing. Um, this is for about a 16 fiber pair system, right? And you can see in the upper left, they have what's called the splice body or the joint. And you have to take each one of those any tiny little individual strands and, and splice it together. And you can see they're on a cassette there in the middle. And you have to wind it around so that you don't bend the fiber too much and break it. And you can see how dense that is there. And then once you have that done, you put it into the molding machine on the bottom, they inject it with the polyethylene, they get the stuff out on the right, and then they have to take an x-ray of that to make sure that there's no leaks or anything, right? Because you're gonna put it back in the water and water inside of there is bad. For 16 fiber pairs, it's not such a big deal, but if you start getting into the larger fiber count, particularly for what are called unrepeated cables, this would be something like the cross the English channel or between Ireland and um, uh, you know, Great Britain, right? Uh, England, I guess. Um, shorter, you don't have necessarily have to have repeaters. Sometimes you put in a much higher fiber count. We're running into challenges about if you, you get to a high fiber count, it starts to take a number of days to work through that. And in locations where the, what's called the weather window, remember you're doing this on a boat in the middle of the ocean in, in, in November, in, in between, you know, in the North Sea, I don't know how many days of clear weather you get because the boat has both of the pieces picked up off the floor of the ocean and they're holding on to it while you're putting these pieces together. So it can be really challenging for very high fiber counts. Um, and it's one of the things that, that goes into, there's a lot of work. I talked about innovation, splicing multiple fiber pairs at the same time. There are new devices being invented to, to, to manage that issue, but it is challenging for sure. Thank you, Tim. I'll just ask the audience any further questions. We have excellent questions so far. Just going to check the Q&A here. I want to go back and just take one other picture just to show it since we have a few. Please, few please feel free, Tim. Yep. Um, I mentioned on the cable ship that they had cable tanks. And so you can see here, putting the cable onto the ship is this gentleman. Normally there would be several, but they, it takes days because they literally feed it in and there are people that walk around inside of the tank, laying it out, packing it in there as tightly as possible. Uh, and this is just a picture of one of them. And you can see in the picture in the middle, all of the repeaters being stored on the ship and all that cable goes around in the tank. And then you got to come out of the tank to store the repeater and then go back into the tank and keep filling it up. So it's very, the loading process is a very difficult logistical one because you got to put the cable in, in the right direction that's reverse of how you're going to lay it and, and those kinds of things. So just uh, pictures, I think always are very helpful. Appreciate that. All right, I haven't had any other questions come in. Thank you, Tim, very much for that overview. Sure. Cynthia, I'm going to pass it over to you for part two on a two Africa deep dive. Thank you, Ava. Thank you. Thank you all. No, sorry.
That's I wasn't great. supposed to swap. Looks, <laughs> it was okay. looks good. Good to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Cynthia Perret, and like Tim, I'm, I'm working at Meta. Um, so I, I'm a senior program manager, and I'm, I've been working in the submarine field for quite a while now, uh, something like 15 years, I think. Uh, and and it, it's quite in line with the studies I've made. I've, I'm a gradu uh, graduate from, uh, you can hear from my accent, of course, I'm, I'm from France. Uh, I studied in France in, um, in, a, in a school which was called Telecom Bretagne. Uh, and where I had a master for an optical degree. Uh, I've always been attracted uh, post-graduation with optics. Uh, don't ask me why, I don't know. It was you know, something fascinating about that. Uh, and, and I was lucky enough that I could really uh, specialize myself in my last year in, in optical telecommunication. Uh, and also um, I was given the chance uh, in my school to, to be able to travel. We, we had one, one really interesting thing that I think helped me for subsea world, which was you had to spend at least two months, if not more, of your time uh, of studies abroad. So you couldn't do everything in France. So you had you had to go anywhere except France. Um, so so it, it it was also to give you that sense of curiosity, uh, learning from other country, other culture, other company, which is definitely something that we are using every day uh, in our, our day job. Uh, and it's, which is also what makes that job so fascinating. So um, I've been lucky enough to work uh, first with Orange and now with Meta on, on various big subsea projects, uh, and most of them in Africa, uh, which is really also a fascinating uh, country, oh, well, continent, sorry, not country. I'm, I'm tired, apologies, it's late in London. So uh, what I will do today is uh, I will drive you through the Two Africa program. So I, I don't know if you have heard about it, but um, we will start with some history around the Africa connectivity landscape and then go more in detail into the Two Africa project and why that project is unique um, and what are the challenges we have been you know, uh, getting for that. But I also want to extend that session, not to speak just about technical, because anyway, Tim spoke much better than me about technical, but about what is also my day job, which is program management, because this is one thing that we not necessarily speak a lot about when we study, but which is key to every project success and which deserves to have you know, some time under the spotlight. So, so I will go through that also at the end. But let's start with um, Africa. So just as a, as a bit of history, when, when we, we worked on to Africa with some of my colleagues, uh, one of them with our uh, optical engineers uh, came back one day and he, he showed us that picture. So you will, you will ask me, yeah, what it is? It's, it's a cable around Africa, yes. But the specificity of that cable is that that project was discussed for the, the first time uh, in the mid 90s, so 30 years ago. Uh, and, and that was the first attempt to fully connect Africa and to have that dream to circle Africa with one cable system, except that at that time, the capacity that we, they were looking at was uh, an initial capacity of one STM16, so approximately 2.5 gigabits. So if you just correlate that to what Tim just you know, mentioned before on, on the new capacity, et cetera, you will see how much of a path uh, and progress we have made uh, over those 30 years. That project never materialized, uh, probably because it was too complex, because it was too costly, uh, because you know, factories or partnership were, were not you know, ready at that time to, to make that happen. Uh, it presented a lot of challenges, but even if it didn't become a reality, Africa wasn't an area that remained underconnected. So there were several initiatives to, to connect Africa and to name a few. Um, so you have like on the West Coast, a cable which is called SAT3, uh, which has been for long the only cable providing connectivity to the West Coast of Africa, and which was also extended to India with the SAFE uh, system. Uh, so I'm just going to show you the map of where we are today and trying to show the system. So SAT3 was on that part of, uh, oh, you don't see my pointer. How can I, that happen? 
Can you see it now? No. There you go. And you just have to select there. Perfect. Yeah. We can see it now. So, so SAT3 was one of the cables going on the West Coast, one of the first and extended to India. Then you had a few initiatives also um, on, the, on the East, uh, one of them being the EC cable, which was also the birth on one of the, I would say, biggest uh, wholesale player right now in Africa, which is WIOC, who managed to put a lot of small countries together to build that system and bring connectivity to East Africa. So on that part. Um, for, for systems that were not connected. You had SICOM also on the East part, and you had another big bunch of cable in 10 years ago, so 2012, with two big systems on the West, which were ACE, so which is also a cable dear to my heart because I worked on that one when I was at Orange, uh, which was a project partially funded by the World Bank and which was one of the projects that connected seven countries with no cable for the first time. And WAX also came at that time, and those two cables, just to give you an idea, so compared to Africa One project, we are already a huge you know, progress because they had approximately uh, one tera per fiber pair, two fiber pair for A, three fiber pair for wax to connect Africa. So it was around uh, 2.5 to 3.5 terabytes to connect the West of Africa. And then came 2022 and the new big project uh, launched by the OGTs to so Equiano on the West Coast and to Africa that we will be talking about today. So, and you will see the gap in terms of capacity. So what is to Africa? Well, that, that's the map I can show you. So to Africa, uh, basically is, we used to say connecting UK to Spain, except that rather than doing that terrestrially, we also do that via, via Cape Town. But more seriously, it's not about Europe. It's really about you know, connectivity in Africa, in underserved country, and also opening this country and connecting them to Europe and Middle East and even Asia with India. So to Africa, it's uh, 45,000 kilometers of cable. Uh, it's 180 terabit of capacity. So you, you can see the gap. The gap is huge compared to what was done 10 years ago, only 10 years ago, uh, where we were talking of five terabit max, only on one side of Africa. So the, the, we have grown exponentially, exponentially um, in, in that landscape over the past few years. But more than capacity, uh, what, what is a challenge and what is making it unique is the number of country and the number of landing and landing stations that we are having. So we are connecting 33 countries and we do have many countries where we have more than one landing. So we have 46 landing station. And each landing station is a project in itself. So you end up with you know, that huge footprint um, where we expect to connect more than 3 billion of people. So that means 36% of the world population with that cable that can go from uh, seven to 16 fiber pair, depending on the, se the, the section, with nine to 10, 12 tera per fiber pair. So that gives you an order of magnitude. It's, it's kind of mind blowing that the, the figures are so big that it's even you know, difficult to imagine what it really means uh, in terms of technology. So, yeah, that, that's a bit more of a detailed view of, of what is to Africa. Uh, we are not taking that project as just one system because you can't deploy at that scale if you were to do everything at the same time. So first, because in terms of capacity, uh, I, th I think the question was, was asked and answered by, by team. Uh, at some point, you have some some limitations, so you need to you know stop somewhere. You need to find a way to power your system. You will have trunk endings, and and this is also the approach we took in uh, into Africa. So it's one system as such, but with five subsystems. And those subsystems, so first you have the the med path, uh, which is between Spain and Italy, uh, and which will be one of the first to be live. Then you are going down, you are connecting Italy to Egypt, a small part which is terrestrial. And then you go from Egypt to South Africa by connecting most of the countries uh, on the east side. 
west, which is probably the biggest one in one, uh, in one slot where you connect South Africa and go back to Europe. And then what has been added uh, a few months after the start of the project is an extension that we call PERS that will also allow to connect all those countries to India and to the Gulf. So to give them even broader connectivity and diversity um, to, to, to the other countries and the other continent. And of course, all of that comes with challenges. So I, I think the, the first thing that we, we, can, we can show and we can discuss is you know, the numbers, uh, just to try to give a sense of, of what it means. We have considering, like, so we mentioned this was a cable of 45,000 kilometers, but because it's not just one fiber pair, it can be up to 16, as I mentioned, it represents uh, 859,000 kilometers of optical fibers. So it's more than 20, 21 times the Earth's circumference. So just, you know, quite a lot. Uh, and it also represents more than 80 tons of ultra -pure, uh, pure material for those fiber. For the deep sea cable, even, uh, those optical fiber represent less than 1% of the weight of the cables that will be loaded on the vessel and installed on the seabed. Because as you saw on Tim's presentation, a cable, it's not just a fiber, it's also everything that is protecting it. So this is the steel, this is uh, the conductor, so copper and aluminum, and this is the polyethylene. And this is also one of the other important figures for to Africa. Uh, for, for a very long time, so copper was the only uh, conductor that was used, but Meta worked on various projects and innovation projects to try to, to switch and you know, provide some other solution with some other type of, of uh, conductor. So we introduced aluminum cable a couple of years ago on, on a smaller project in Europe. It worked. And um, with that confidence that we could deploy that at bigger scale, we decided that two of our system on to Africa, so the MED system and the North system, would be deployed with aluminum cable. So that's also something that is unique about to Africa. This is the first, I would say, long distance system, so approximately 4,000 kilometers that will be deployed with aluminum cable. And so if we look at all of that, another figure is when you add everything, so the fiber, uh, the polyethylene, the conductor, and the steel, we have more than 50,000 tons of cable that will be installed uh, under the seabed, more than 400 tons of submerged equipment. Uh, so it's approximately a thousand of bodies that we will have underwater, whether it's repeaters, uh, equalizer, BU, rodoms. And even more impressive, uh, knowing that the fleet of vessels you know, we don't have like uh, 200 vessels around the earth to, to lay a uh, submarine cable. Uh, I don't know exactly what is the number, but it's probably something between 10 to 15. Uh, someone may know better than me and could correct me. But we will be using, uh, we, we will be running right, uh, shortly with five vessels, you know, laying the system. And I think at the maximum, uh, it will be up to six. So. It's, it's really important. It's really mobilizing a lot of people at the same time to deploy that network. Uh, and, and you know we are all putting our patient into that to make sure it's gonna be a success. And wh what we have seen also you know, with this new um, technologies that have been introduced uh, for to Africa, uh, and, and I will come back to aluminum for that, is that uh, the supplier on their side particularly have been able to you know, provide technical solution uh, for problems that were sometimes discovered while we were doing the design and while we were working on qualifying the equipment and, and you know, thinking of the deployment. So one of the things that amazed me particularly when I was working on that was uh, the remedial work they had to put in place in the factory to make sure that the aluminum cable especially was fit for purpose. Um, so everybody was well aware of how you would manufacture a cable with copper we have been doing that for quite a long time. So, you know, the manufacturing line were, no, no, they knew what they had to do. Everything was fit for, for copper, but aluminum presents different physical characteristics. 
And for example, is much more sensitive to dust or you know, so, some small, uh, small particles that can impact then um, the, 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 the conductivity and the resistivity of uh, what we, we are doing. So we, we went to Calais, uh, Calais factory, uh, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago. There were some issues with the, the line. They didn't really know what happened. And then people with a lot of experience at some point thought, okay, oh, this is because there is dust somewhere. Something doesn't work. So we need to think about that. And they, they came with something which was very ingenious and you know, not very high tech, uh, but just some kind of a protection to make sure that when they, they were going through the, the conductor line, well, the cable was protected, the aluminum was protected, and the level of purity, I would say, of, of what, what was happening to, for the conductor layer was good enough so that we don't detect any default later. And, and again, all of that could look like quick mechanical fix, uh, but all of that was very ingenious also and was possible because of the expertise of people on the field in the factory. It's not something that you can solve you know, with theoretical work or with a lot of PowerPoint or whatever, it's really people with hands on uh, to, to, to do that job happening. So, so that was also something that was fascinating with Two Africa was to see how the problem we are, were solved in real time. So what we want to do, of course, with that is to build you know, a transformative subsea cable to better connect Africa. We want to increase capacity, quality, availability of the internet connectivity between Africa and the rest of the world. But this is not something that you can do alone. Uh, you know, Meta on his own cannot do that. That's why one also of the most important word for that project is partnership. You, you need to partner. You need to partner with you know, uh, whoever it is that knows a country and wants to land in a country. You need to find people who want to invest in, in, in that project with you, who believe in the project. So you really need to create uh, an environment where people will be willing you know, to work together to make that dream become reality. Uh, so we, we had to, to achieve that by also um, providing some new kind of partnership model which was not just about you know, sharing a spectrum, all having the same level of investment, very fixed configuration, everybody going to the same country and so on. But we came with something that was a bit more innovative compared to the old consortium world, which was to change the, the way ownership worked. So instead of having a small share of a spectrum going to various countries with some of them that may not be of interest to you, we have been proposing a model of ownership at fiber pair level and each fiber pair to be independent from each other. So for example, if you have an interest, uh, I don't know, in South Africa, in Tanzania, in Kenya, and in Europe, you could have a fiber pair that was only connected to this country and you didn't have really to worry about what could be happening on the road in Mozambique or in Sudan because you, you were not having your fiber pair being brought in this country. But on contrary, if you are an African operator with a lot, of, a lot of opcos and what you want is not a highway between hubs, but connectivity for your affiliates, and you want to connect, again, I'm going to take the same example. You want to connect South Africa, Mozambique, Sudan, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, for example, you could also do that. So everybody was able to customize how they want to invest. They were also able to drop some from time to time from a branch if they thought they couldn't make it happen because it was too heavy or too costly. But that could have been done without jeopardizing the entire investment model for the other parties. So that was pretty, pretty important to make it happen. On top of that, we also wanted to, to make sure that everybody, uh, whatever their level of investment was and whatever the number of countries they were landing in, was feeling heard and you know, could benefit from the project. So the partnership model also came with equal voting rights. Your rights usually are linked to the amount you invest in a system. That's not the case here. So your rights, you're a party, one party, one vote. Meaning that nobody is seen as a small party that you won't listen to. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has the same right you know, to object or to agree on something. And everybody has the same transparent access to information. 
So that, that kind of partnership, uh, you know, it kind of disrupts what is being done today, uh, in, in, was done before in the subsea world. It's kind of innovative. So the innovation onto Africa is not just technical, it's also in terms of all what I mentioned. Uh, that openness is key to have the trust between the partner so that you can keep progress. And the trust with the partners is one thing, but the other important aspect is the trust with the supplier. Because if you are working in an environment where it's like, oh, I'm the purchaser, I have all the rights, I can do what I want, you are the supplier, you need to listen to me and do what you are, you are, we are asking you to do, doesn't work. It doesn't work because the project is far too complex for that. So you have to work as a team, you have to understand the constraint on both sides, and you have to always find a way to find a win-win solution so that you can keep moving. So now talking about timelines, because as you have seen, so big project, uh, well, I must say we are not really with, within the 24 month scale that Tim mentioned, uh, which is a typical length of a subsea cable. Uh, so as just to give you an idea, we, the, the initial discussion started uh, in Meta uh, early 2018. Uh, so it was even before I joined the company. So I, I can't tell you a lot about that. I was not there. But, you know, so it's like uh, almost five years ago. It took two years to bring those first discussion and that first idea into a contract. So two years of getting to get partners on board, getting to negotiate the contract, getting, you know, get an offer, understanding everything that we were willing to do, finding the right partners in the landings, uh, trying to make an assessment on what we could do, what we couldn't do. Uh, so a lot of work during those two years which is what we call contract signature and CIF, and which is when the deployment work is really started, starting. So of course you do a lot of things. Uh, I'm not going into the details. You do the procurement, you do the design, et cetera. Uh, but from the time the contract is signed until the time we can start loading the cable on a vessel, we are from March, 2020 to Jan, 2022. So two more years. Uh, then you lay the cable, you commission, and 18 months later, we should have two Africa East ready for service. And one year later, we will have two Africa West ready for service and pearls. So if you take it from the start until the end, we are talking of six years of work. Six years of work mobilizing, I would say tens, if not hundreds of people uh, to be really focused on that project to keep moving to, de to deliver it uh, under the timeline. So six years seems like you know, a very long time, but actually considering everything that needs to be done, if everything happens in that time frame, uh, we will all be very happy and see that as a, as a tremendous success. So talking also a bit beyond the subsea part. So you have all the subsea aspects uh, that that team you know, went through, uh, technically speaking. One of the other aspects of To Africa is uh, it, it is what we call the first cable system that has been um, designed and uh, thought uh, to enable service providers to obtain capacity on carrier neutral facilities or what we would call open access cable learning station uh, to have what, what we want to see as a fair and equitable basis for everybody so that we can boost the development of the internet ecosystem. And that we are not you know, trapped sometimes that it, as it can be in some market uh, with an historic player that has you know, all, all the entry uh, in the country and that will charge you a lot to be able to connect to any backhaul or to go outside of the station. So that was also a long part of the negotiation, which was to make sure that we could have cross connection in those data centers, which are capacity independent. So whether you need 10 gig, 200 gig, or one terabit, you will pay the same. Uh, but it also means that when you want to upgrade your capacity by changing a card, you won't pay more. So it's, it's, it's easy then for you to forecast your business plan, uh, and it will allow also to have a more competitive market. And we also wanted to make sure that any local license operator would be able to access that capacity, even if they were not investors in the system. 
So they would still have to purchase capacity on the system, but at least the entry barrier to have the cross connect would be capped and would make it easier, you know, to, to go and, uh, and be able to, to use uh, the two Africa resources. So it may seem a bit obvious, you know, that we want open access, but it's not something that was done before. So if, if you look at the, the, the previous cable I was mentioning, cable like set three, like ACE, uh, probably easy, even if I'm not so familiar with it, those cable were working on a, on a system which we call half circuit or full circuit, which means you had capacity on the cable, but the part uh, that was within a certain country where only one license entity was allowed to activate traffic, so you had to buy circuit from them, even if you had the capacity on the cable, so that you can light up your capacity point A to point B. And usually, because it was a closed market with only one actor, competition didn't work. So you, you would end up with, with prices that were pretty high and that were decreasing pretty slowly. So this is really all the things that to Africa is trying to address. So that beyond the subsea system, if the internet cost for all the ISPs, uh, all local small operator is decreasing, then the final user will benefit from it because normally, you know, you will see your mobile data cost decrease and so on, and people should be able to access more easily the internet uh, and all the services associated to that. And hopefully also it will allow to, to boost a bit the economy uh, for digital services and for all the enterprise that are, that are in, uh, in Africa. So that is, I would say, for the for the for the two Africa part and and you know uh, the scale of it and the and and the generality. But once we have said that, uh, then we we have to go to what makes this project really a challenge, uh, and what are the, the 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 challenges we are facing. So I I often say, uh, and you know some of the technical people may disagree. Uh, I often say that the technical challenges are the easiest to solve. Uh, well, first, because we have smart engineers working with us, so they can always find a mitigation plan and a, work, and a workaround. Uh, and also because, in a way, we can control uh, the technical part of you know, what is happening. So I, I can give you an example on, on some things that happened on to Africa, uh, again, on the aluminum cable. We had a couple of tests in the factory that didn't go exactly the way we wanted to. So there was a lot of discussion, but if we do that during a repair, something may happen to the cable. So we don't really like it. We need to find a way. There was an easy fix. The easy fix was to up armor the cable. Easily done. So you just, okay, you have to make a bit of you know, uh, reworking at the factory. You have to go through an armoring line, but at the end of the day, you can control that. You know how long it's going to take. You can prioritize if you need your armoring and you can keep going for your project. So easy. But beyond techniques, uh, we are facing many issues which are often beyond our control. So I'm, I'm going to walk through for a, bit, uh, a few examples for that uh, with what we have been going through and how we have been trying to address that. And, and I would say it's already a start of the program management bit that I will address just after. So. Our first issue, and probably one of the biggest uh, challenge that we have is permit. You can't lay a cable if it's not permitted. Uh, why? Well, because you are going into a country, so you are using uh, their territorial uh, seabed, you are using public domain, uh, so you need authorization to do that. It's not, you know, it's not private. It's not, you can't, you can do whatever you want. Well, you can't do whatever you want anyway, even on a private land, but here, because it's also using public, uh, pu public domain, uh, you, you really have to go through a permitting process to, to get that done. So permits, so you have a variety of them. Uh, one of the most important one is the environmental permits. Uh, so you have to make that assessment. So if you are a bit familiar with the industry, you know that a cable will not damage the environment. But because it's seen as critical infrastructure, because you will have some beach work when you may need to open a trench on, on the beach, 
because you have this big mainlet vessel that are coming nearby, you know, there is always that wonder, oh, what impact can it have? Uh, there might be also some, you know, electromagnetic stuff happening with the cable. There can be a lot of things. So we need to make an assessment. So, so you have to go through all of that. And, and by doing all of that, you have to, to work with a lot of authorities and various entities uh, within the authorities. And it takes a lot of time. Uh, there is a slowness of the bureaucracy. There is also uh, the fact that, you know, sometimes you are working with subcontractors who do not really know the country, do not know the shortcut. So they are trying to do the best they can, but then you end up in like a much more complex process than what you initially thought because the way it's presented made people think that it's like an oil and gas project, for example. So something that you expect to take, to take 12 months can take 18, can take 20. You don't know because you don't have control on you know, how long the, the bureaucracy is going to take and the authority are going to take to sign you the paper that you need. Uh, so you have also, those permits are also giving you a lot of conditions. So for example, you are prevented to work during a touristic period in various areas in, uh, in, in um, well, everywhere because the beaches are used uh, during, during summer. So of course you can't work there. So you have all those constraints that you need to factor that are part of your permitting process into your project to make sure you can keep going. What happens if you don't get a permit? Well, you can't land the cable. Uh, and the worst scenario is that when you think everything is on track, your vessel is you know, starting to go, and then someone tells you, oh, by the way, you are missing a paper, and you didn't know you were missing the paper, and you will have standby with the vessel. So a vessel costs like 100K a day. So this is something you want to avoid at all costs because you know it, it gets it gets high in terms of extra cost very fast. So, so you need to secure the permits. Uh, and, and when you have like into Africa 33 countries, it means 33 different processes. Uh, it means hundreds of paperwork. Uh, so you, you, can, you can imagine uh, all the risks that, that are linked to that. But it's not the only thing that is beyond our control. Another one, uh, which you know, we don't really think about is weather. Uh, we are working outside and whether, uh, you know, whatever storms, uh, hurricanes, uh, currents, it's something that can really impact your program. So for example, uh, I can give you an example of something that happened to us uh, three months ago. We were supposed to launch the cable in Somalia uh, in July, 14th of July, exactly. But at that time, well, there were strong currents which prevented the vessel to be stable enough to perform the operation. So the operation was aborted. So what, what do you do after that? You have to find a new plan. You have to find a new slot on when you can come. And you also have to make sure that when you come back, you won't face the same weather or current situation. So you have to make a full review of the weather data uh, to try to find the best window for you to be able to go and lay the cable. So again, for, for us, you know, a rain, well, it's just a rain. Weather, sunny weather, that's nice. Bit of a, you know, a hurricane, yes, we don't like that, but it's gonna take two days, it's gonna pass and, you know, whatever. For a project like To Africa, all that kind of events can have a dramatic impact because you would have to reschedule and meaning you have to remobilize a lot of resources and you will have knock off effect and so on. So weather is also one of the key aspects that we don't control and that will impact us. Uh, less joyful, piracy and security. Uh, we, we heard a lot, uh, I think, on the news about you know, pirates. Uh, unfortunately, they do not all look like a Johnny Depp. Uh, it's usually less, less fun than what we can see on screen. Uh, you have several areas in the globe where you have to be super careful and when you may sometimes have to stop your operation because there is a risk for the safety of the people and the first priority is to keep people safe. So there is a map here showing the Gulf of Guinea uh, where you will see a lot of small uh, red points, I hope, 
All of that will show you uh, all the events that happened in 2021, which are security event and piracy event. So when you have a cable like, like to Africa that will really go all across the coast and that will land in Nigeria, you can imagine that when the vessel is entering that area, there is you know, a bit of stress on what can happen. So of course, there are mitigation measures that are being taken by the vessels. Uh, they, they will have you know, private security, they will have escort vessel, they will have everything that they, they can do to make sure that everybody is safe. But sometimes you will have an alert that will force you to cut the cable, put it on a buoy and go away and come back later. So this is also something we have to deal with. And because nobody will compromise ever with the safety of, of the people, uh, well, when it happens, you just accept it. And then, you know, you come back later and trying to find another way to, to finish the work. And on top of the piracy, you also have what we call a ghost vessel. So you, you can see here a picture from a company that is called Unseen Labs. And what they have done is they have developed through nanosatellites uh, a maritime surveillance kind of tool by using the electromagnetic signature of ships. Uh, so they have a small fleet of satellites that will give an updated picture of a zone uh, every hour. So why is it interesting? Uh, you can see two colors on, on that slide, on that picture. You can see red, uh, signals and you can see blue signals. So the red one are vessels that are turning on the IES system, which is a GPS uh, you know, positioning system that allow people to track where they are and which normally should be on for all vessels navigating in the sea. And everything that you see in, uh, in blue uh, are what we will call ghost vessels, meaning those vessels don't turn up they are IES, and officially they do not exist because you can't see them uh, on the official tracker and on the radar. But the fact is that they are here. Uh, and why is it an issue for our operation? So not so much maybe for, for, for the lay, but later for the operation and for you know, the, the maintenance of the system. If you don't know that a vessel in, is near your cable, you can't warn them that there is an infrastructure there and that they have a risk to damage it if they anchor in that area. Worse than that, some of those vessels will be trawlers. What do they do? They just troll on the seabed. And when they troll, if there is a cable, the cable will just be cut and destroyed and there is nothing you can do. So because officially you can't contact them because they do not exist, you can see the damage that it can make to the connectivity uh, worldwide for, for the cable. So that's another challenge. And another one, not the last, but another one of the big one is uh, what I say, the geopolitics. Uh, so I've taken here the example of the election. Uh, why? Because when you have an election, uh, especially when the country is not very stable and everything can change, if there is a change of government, you face the risk that the project that was approved by government can then be denied, can be suspended, uh, or you can also face some civil unrest if the election doesn't go well and, and you know, people contest to, to whatever the result is. So if, if you have civil unrest, it means you can't work there. It means you have to stop some activity potentially, especially in the cable landing station. So you have to be uh, cognizant of this election period to make sure that you will avoid them as much as possible when you have to send people on site. So this constraint also needs to be taken into account in our project plan. Uh, and talking about geopolitics, uh, ju just to emphasize one thing that Tim mentioned earlier, which is you know, a cut that people think are happening on the sea, but actually are on the, on the land. It happened in the past that some people, because there is do civil unrest, decide to create a fake cut. So we'll you know, just disconnect the cable, claim that there is something at sea, so that the country is kind of disconnected from the internet and there is no communication. So all of that is also something that we need to factor in and that we are dealing with uh, from time to time. So yeah, 
all of that is what we have to, to look at and what we have to, to, to manage to deploy to Africa. But because you know we like challenges, it's not enough. So we had the good idea to start deploying to, Af to Africa at the beginning of COVID. Uh, so what it is to deploy to Africa in a pandemic time? Well, I won't lie, it's, a, it's exhausting. Uh, because of course you will face additional challenges. And one of, one of the most you know, biggest challenges for me, I think, is that we had to stop face-to-face -face meetings. So everybody, you know, is talking about like, oh, we can work remote, we can work and do everything over VCs. Yes, but no, uh, because when you work in a consortium like to Africa, you you run meetings with thirty people around the table. So getting thirty people involved just on VC is much more complex than when you are all in the same room face to face and that you can, you know, talk together exchange view, disagree also, because it's much easier to disagree face-to-face -face than on video call. So by having to go completely remote for 18 months, everything took much more time. Uh, you had to make sure that you can keep people engaged during this meeting when they were virtual. So you had to deploy strategy. How I, I, why, would I get them to answer to my question? How would I be sure that even if the camera is off, they are listening to me? How can you know? How can I make sure that everybody participates? And more important than that, everybody understands what is being discussed, because it's much more difficult also to raise your hand on VC to say, "Oh, can you can you go back to that? I didn't get it." When you are face to face, you take a break, you go in the corridor, you you can discuss you know casually, and you can solve a lot of things. So all of that disappeared. So we had to develop some new program management strategy. And I would say the most important one is communicate, 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 even more than before. It is often said that 80% of our job as program manager is communication. And it has never been as true as during the pandemic. So we had to make sure that you know, people were feeling comfortable to discuss, people were feeling comfortable to reach out to us outside of the meeting. Uh, and that we could exchange freely, you know, and, and so that was really key to make it happen. But you also had to make sure that, you know, you were keep moving. So you, you had to come to conclusion and you had to, to make decision. So when you were stuck in, in, especially at the design phase, when people were not able to make a final decision on, you know, what branch they wanted to have, what type of design they wanted to have on the branch, as a PM, you had to be proactive in offering solution and option. And at the end of the day, tell to people, okay, you have three options here. You have a deadline to decide and you have to come back by that deadline. So you have to stay firm on your requirements. You have to kind of try to narrow down what is feasible and make sure that you, you give a strong deadline and incentive to people to come back, but also make sure that you offer them choices so that they are not stuck with something that doesn't work for them and nothing else being offered as a workout. And you also need to ensure that everyone is being given a voice uh, to express their concern, to express their view, and to discuss with everybody else. There is nothing worse, I would say, than ignoring your partners, because if you do that, you break the trust. And if you break the trust, you can't make it work. So what will make it a success at the end, I hope? Patience, I think, is one of the key things that, uh, that, that we need. Patience and tenacity. So don't be afraid to go back to people and ask over and over again the same thing until you've got an answer. Communication. So I think I, I went through that quite a lot already. Trust. Uh, trust is really important. Being able to open openly talk about problems that you are facing, uh, you know, is, is important because if you hide everything and it, it blows up anywhere at the last minute. So if you trust people, you can, you know, they can come up front with whatever doesn't work for them and you can work together on a solution. So trust is also something that is key. And on top of that, uh, I think what, what makes it work for us as, as a consortium and as a team is passion. All the people working on that project are passionate about it. And without that passion, without that dedication to make it work, you know, if you were treating that like a day-to-day -day job where you, you are just doing your hours and then you walk away, there is no way you can make it happen. So you're, 
in a way, you have to be in love with your with your with your job to to make it work, which I think is the case of most of us. So, and I will stop it here for my presentation, and happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Cynthia. That was very thorough. I, I have had a couple questions come in. Will to Africa connect to some countries that don't yet have a submarine cable or even internet connection? Um, so when we designed the project, there was one country, yes, like that, which is uh, Somaliland. So in between, they had another cable that arrived. But if I am correct, I think it's the only one that was not having an, an access to a, a subsea cable. All the other cables were having at least one. Uh, but one is not enough. So, you know, getting a second cable anyway is as important as getting the first one because you want that diversity. Uh, to have a real, reliable network. And, and that kind of leads me to the next question. What's the biggest difference between two Africa and other subsea networks? Obviously it's size, but what else would you say? Collaboration, the communication, the permitting, what would you say was the number one, you know, changer or challenge for two Africa? Well, it's really the scale because at the end of the day, it's a project, you know, it's a subsea project. So it's kind of the same step, except that you are multiplying the number of issues by 46. Most of the problem arrives uh, in the stations because either a station is not ready or a permit is not there. I think the main challenge is everybody focus on the, the sec what I call the sexy part of subsea, which is the vessel and the cable. But actually, this is also the easy part. What is really complex is to make sure that all your stakeholders in all your country are focused on delivering an infrastructure that can host the cable. Because if you don't have the beach manual, if you don't have the station, your cable is useless. So marine has its challenges. And don't, don't take me wrong. It, it has a lot of challenges. But you can still find a way to resequence for a time. If you, if you are facing some issues somewhere, you can go to another jurisdiction and so on. If you don't have your station, you can't do anything. So I think for me, that was really the biggest challenge. People see a project that is you know, delivered in three years time and they don't get the, the urgency to start the dry part of it. You say, oh, I have time. The cable is not gonna be there before 2022. So why do you want me to start my, my construction of the station in 2020? Well, I want you to do that because I know it's going to be on the critical path Step because one, you will have exactly. permitting issues, et cetera. So number of stations, I think, is really our uh, main challenge in that project. Understandable. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the Two Africa project started in the 90s. Uh, you know, are there any other projects or submarine cables that you've known that have taken 30 years to come to fruition? So the project in the 90s was not to Africa. It was, a, 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 you know, completely different players, but it was an idea that was floating around with, uh, with, with other people and that was abandoned. So uh, it was completely different players than to Africa. Different. Okay. Yeah, it yep. was just to make sure, to they know that. sure yep. that, you know, that idea is not new. The project is new, but the idea has been floating around for quite a while. But to Africa is the first project that managed to make it come to, to life. Thanks. Sorry. Can you name some of the challenges as a woman in your role that you feel that you face in a job like yours? Uh, well, actually, I never felt any issue of being a woman. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, it's linked to because I'm a strong minded person because I talk a lot or whatever. Uh, Yes, of course, you always have, you know, one or two persons that will not trust you as an expert when you start. But I think the subsea world is, is, is really a world where people, if you are open minded, we are all curious, we are all eager to learn from each other. One of the common ground from all of us, I think, is really that that curiosity to learn from each other. So we all come from different backgrounds, whether it's, you know, uh, country, culture, religion, whatever it is. So gender doesn't make, from my experience, gender doesn't make a difference. International waters don't have, I'm sorry. How do you navigate permits in international waters? Well, you, you said it either. You don't have permits in international waters. Oh, so okay. I, yeah, you can, you can just go and lay in international waters. The only thing that you need to, to, to take care of is security. If, 
security issue. Okay, that was the last question I had. I'll give everybody a minute or two. If you have any further questions, feel free to ask them. You can chat them either in the uh, comments section or on the Q&A and we'll address those. Otherwise, we'll give you a couple minutes back into your day. All right, I think that's everything. With that, we'll wrap up today's session. I want to thank you again for your participation and a special thank you to both Tim and Cynthia for their presentations. Please join us next Tuesday, October 4th, same time, same place, where session number three will be Sienna, and we'll, they will provide insights on the optics of the submarine cable and then what Sienna contributes to that. Again, I, I appreciate your participation, and I hope all have a good evening. Thank you so much.